time we sort of saw a pattern of, we introduced the pattern of how, in a nutshell, client-side JavaScript works. And keeping in mind that JavaScript gets delivered to the client, to the browser, when the web page gets delivered as, as part of that package. So in addition to the HTML code that comes over and the CSS code, the JavaScript comes over. And the JavaScript provides for interactivity. You know, it, it provides for the ability to change the contents of the page without having to go back to the server and making a request for a new page. All right. It does that by following, in most cases, a formula. The formula is that some of them gets the ball rolling. And typically by event, we mean some sort of user interaction. That is, their user, the user puts their mouse over something on the screen, or the user clicks on something, or the user types something on the keyboard. Those are the kinds of things we mean. But it's not exclusively that. There's other cases too. Like for example, you can invoke some JavaScript when the page loads initially. All right, that's a user event. They loaded the page. You can also put JavaScript to go off like on a timer to refresh or to do something every certain amount of time. So keep in mind I'm talking in generalities here. This is typically the case. But typically there's some user event. And what was the user event we used in the example last time? We used a hover? Oh, well, I, I showed a hover in the one example. You're right, with the menu. And that's actually an on mouse over event. What was the one that we used in my example with the a button? And what about the button? What event did we use associated with the button? On click. Right. You'll you typically I mean you'll see these events start with the word on. In other words, when someone clicks on this. On a click of this, do this. Um, we're going to look in a, in a few minutes here at a list of the different events you have. That's probably the simplest part of it. Sometimes it's confusing, and sometimes you have choices of how to do things, but that's pretty straightforward figuring that out. The one thing to remember is that you want to put the event on the thing that the user is going to interact with not on the thing that's going to change. So if the user is going to hover over the thumbnail and it's going to change the big image, you put the on mouse over event on the thumbnail, not on the big image. So the one thing, you, you put the event on the thing that's going to invoke the change, not the thing that's itself going to be changed. Once we do that, we have JavaScript. And what does JavaScript entail? Well, there's rules to the language, which we'll go over and which will evolve over the next few weeks. There's also a key part of it, which is a document object model. And the document object model says that anything on the page, we can change. All right? The document object model allows us to change anything on the page. Specifically, it allows us to change properties of the elements of the page. And what do I mean by properties? What's another word for properties? Pardon me? Features. Features. Characteristics. Attributes. And how do properties of stuff on a web page get set? CSS well, yes. The CSS would be one. Where else can they be set? In the HTML themselves. All right. So, for example, let's say we have this. A href equals http google.com. What's the property of this tag? The, the link itself. The href is the property. And what value does that property have? It has a value of http google.com. Can we use JavaScript to change that link? Absolutely. 
How do we use JavaScript to change that link? We use JavaScript to change that link by pointing to this thing, by being able to point to this element and accessing this property. So some of the properties for things on the page are set just in the HTML. When you code a link, when you code an image, you give properties to it. Other properties come from the CSS. So if I had CSS for this that said style, another property of that link and it's a property we can go in and change all right to change these properties? We use the DOM to change these properties by, first of all, pointing to the thing that we want to change, right? Keep in mind, we could have a bunch of stuff on our page. We could have a dozen links on our page. We could have a lot of images. We could have a lot of stuff on our page. So we have to be specific and say what it is we want to change. That's where IDs typically are used, all right? An ID, remember, ought to be unique. And we talked about that in CISS 216 with regards to style sheets, but it becomes especially important here when we talk about JavaScript. All right? Your student ID is unique, right? So if I say that student number 123, I want to change from a C to a B, their grade, that student number one, two, three points to just one student. I'm not going to change like five students' grades by doing that. That would be a bad thing if that was the case, right? You want the ID unique so we can reference just one particular student. Same thing here. The ID ought to be unique so that in JavaScript I can point to that one thing that I want to change. All right? And we can change any of the properties of this <coughs> simply by using the DOM to access and change them. How do we use a DOM? Well, one of the workhorses in JavaScript is a method called get element by ID. What that does is that says find a thing on the page with this ID. Find it because I want to do something with it. All right. One thing about JavaScript is that it is case sensitive. So the word document is lowercase. This function, get element by ID, the first letter of the first word is lowercase. Each subsequent word, the first letter is uppercase. What do I put in the parentheses then? I put the ID that I'm interested in. What do I put after that? I put the property that I want to change. If the property is in the HTML, I simply do this. The name of the property, in this case, the href property. If the property is in the style, I do the, oh my God, I just broke this marker. If the property is in the style, I do the same thing, except I proceed it by style. One little twist is if you notice there's a dash in font family, whenever there's a property with a dash in it, we don't put the dash in JavaScript, we say font family, like that. So, user 
trigger events, trigger JavaScript. JavaScript is a language that has a set of kinds of statements in it. And we can do simple ones, we can do more complex ones. But they're all going to do the same thing at some point. They're going to point to something on the screen and they're going to make a change to it. All right, so let's look at some examples of user events. And let's download the example that we had last time and let's expand on it a bit. Under events, we can look and we can see a list of them here. And here's a list of common ones. On change, an HTML element has been changed. On click, on mouse over, on mouse out, on key down, on load. And there's a lot of other ones that are used less often than this. We have a whole list of them. All right. We'll, we're going to sample some of these in the examples over the next few days. We started out with the basic on click. All right. simple example last time where we simply had a page HTML page that when you clicked on it it made that appear how do we make it so it disappeared again if there's another button Actually, yeah, we, we, we didn't do this with the visibility property. We did it with the display property. But, yeah, in, in a nutshell, that's, uh, that's correct. Where did it go? Oh, here it is. You'll learn the purpose of these properties. The difference between display of none and visibility of hidden is that a hidden thing still takes up a certain amount of space, whereas a display of none doesn't display and it doesn't take up any space. So if we had, for example, if we had a paragraph underneath this,
notice that that here is a paragraph is right there. If I click this C, it gets bumped down because the display of none, that paragraph that was invisible took up no space. If I make visibility hidden and I change the visibility to visible notice that the difference is is now where Thomas Jefferson was there's a blank space because even though it's not visible it still takes up that space and so I hit C and it pops in place there now which you want to do depends on the particular problem you're working on you know either one of these is is potentially a valid um, a valid thing all right okay let's go and let's see what else we can do let's change the event Let's change the event so that, let's get rid of the button. And let's change it so that when they put their mouse over the question, they see the answer. How would we do that? Well, we want to hover over the question, who was the third president? For hover, it's on mouse over. And then equals, well, it's the same thing we had before, document dot get element by ID answer. File, visibility equals visible. So now I save it, refresh. If I put my mouse over that paragraph, it displays. All right. I just sneak up on it because if I went straight down, I'd be in that paragraph. So, boom, I put my mouse over top of it, it does it. How do you suppose we can make it disappear? On, on mouse out, right. So I could say, on mouse out, document get element by ID blah 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 visibility equals hidden Let's look at what we were looking at last time. What's the difference between this? and the example we just did. Yeah, there's, there's more, all right? There was more attention paid to the formatting of it. There's 
more example, there's more content to it and all that. But in essence, this is simply an extension of that example we had before. All right? So um, what I like to do is I like to come up with a scheme like this to do um, a primitive version of, of this menu. All right? You know, we're not going to, you know, we're only going to do this as a class example. We're not going to, you know, make it, um, you know, as extensive as this example. But we can do something pretty pretty straightforward and pretty simple um, that will show us how this works. All right. So let's go in and let's rename this guy to menu. What HTML code is this stuff? Could be a div. I, I, we, we could find out for sure if we looked at the code, but let's let's just speculate. Could be a div, or a section, or a nav. All right. And what do you think the nav would consist of? Would consist of unordered links. I'm sorry, an unordered list of links, all right? Because this is a list of links. And it's unordered because I could rearrange these if I wanted to. There's no real reason why MLB is before the MBA, all right? That's just the order that they decided to put it in. So, we're going to use this example to sort of show how these things fit together. All right, the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript. So let's start out by making a menu in a nav section. For those of you that are not familiar with HTML5, HTML5 now has a set of container or structural tags that expand on what we used to use divs for. If you looked at an HTML4 web page, you'd see a bunch of divs. Each div corresponded to a section of the page, all right, or a division of the page, a section of the page. In HTML5, what they've done is they've done separate tags for the different things that you use divs for. In other words, what did you use divs for in HTML4, you use a div for the page header. You use a div for the navigation. You'd use a div for the content area. You'd use a div for the footer, and so on down the line. In HTML5, there's a whole set of things that replace divs, that are more specialized version of divs. And nav is one of them. Nav says, hey, this is a navigation area. All right? Uh, if you had, uh, you know, like if you had a main nav and a sub nav, absolutely. All right. We're going to make an unordered list of links. All right. And I'm not going to bother to create all the pages. All right. We'll just we'll make up a few and we'll just fake the href. Now you might say, I hope you wouldn't say this after having CISS 2.16, but you might say, gee, I want my links to be horizontal. I don't want them to be in a bulleted list. And a bulleted list is what an LI is going to give me. All right? What's the response to that? Exactly. And what, we, what are we going to use to do that? CSS. CSS, exactly. This is a list. 
So it should be in a list tag. Now the fact that we want the list to be horizontal instead of vertical, that's fine, but that's something that falls under CSS. All right, so let's go and let's make a few links. I'll just put an href of pound sign here just to be simple. And I'll create some of these, NBA. One thing I tried to do in this class too, in addition to going over the JavaScript, is reviewing the use of CSS. Obviously for this to work, to be able to change the properties in CSS and HTML, you better know what those properties are to begin with, right? So we're going to spend some time talking about that as, as well. All right. Also, in the interest of time, sometimes I'm going to put my style right in the page itself. You know that putting an external style sheet is the better practice because we can reuse that from page to page. But it just makes it convenient when I'm talking in class to be able to have everything all on one page. All right, don't think that you should do that. You should continue to do as you've done in CISS 216 and put an external style sheet. So. I can go and I can say nav ul list <coughs> style type colon none. What's that going to do? It's going to get rid of the bullet points. Now notice that I don't have the need for IDs here, right? If we were doing this in HTML4 and we were using divs, well, we wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily want all our divs to, to have this, this style. We'd just want the navigation div. So we'd say like ID of nav. This makes it a little more easy to do this. And I'm going to make the list items have a display of block. I'm sorry, display of inline. They're, they are block tags. And I'm going to make the nav have a background color of white or a black. And I'll make my links have a color of white. All right. We're going to, within reason, try to duplicate this to at least some degree. All right. Let's save this. And bring it up. And we have our links here. All right. How would I put space in between them? Padding or margin. Could take could get rid of the underline. Padding. Left. decoration none all right there we have that how can we get the hover effect exactly nav a hover Colon hover is a pseudo class. Um, 
We actually could do this via JavaScript, but since this particular capability is built in within CSS, we might as well do that. And I think what they did is they made the background white and the color blue. we want to do is we want to make a subsection for each of these. All right. How are we going to do that? Okay. Right. Okay. Good. You, you actually gave me two pieces of the puzzle. Number one is, you said create a section. This is extra content we're adding to the page, right? So it needs to be, we're going to create some more HTML. In this case, a section is probably as good as, as anything. All right? And she also gave the CSS, which, again, we could look to see how they did it. Looks like display is none. That doesn't take up any space. So we could go in and say, and we'll, we'll do, a, oh, you can do all four of them. What the heck? Section ID equals NBA. Of course, we could put as much content as we wanted to in here. I'm just putting just a little bit of placeholder text in, but you certainly could go and expand this. we can go in and we can make all of these
didn't like that comma syntax. I thought that was I thought that was legit. did wrong the first time. Yeah, probably typed something wrong. If this was the NFL, would review the tape right now and would, <laughs> would sit back and, you know, and then would have a guy in a striped shirt come and say, you know, the play on the field was overruled. All right. So now, it's important to, in my mind, it's important to see how these pieces fit together. Each thing does its job. The content is in the HTML. So in other words, when the user requests this page, they get everything. They only see parts of it, but they get everything. All right? Now, um, through CSS, we hide the things that we don't want them to see immediately. But they still have all the HTML. Now, with JavaScript, we supply the interactivity. Whereas, when they put their mouse over something, then it appears. So, how would we do that? On mouse over equals document get element by ID NBA style display equals block. Let's see what happens when we do this. Put our mouse over there, that appears. Put our mouse over there, yeah. Each one's displaying, but the other one isn't hiding. All right. So we got a problem. All right. Let's 
hold that thought for a second here. All right. And let's talk about troubleshooting if you have a JavaScript problem. HTML, as languages go, is very forgiving. In other words, if you make a mistake in your HTML, the page, the rest of the page displays. If you use a tag that doesn't exist, if I make up a tag, that text will appear, it just won't be formatted any special way. All right? JavaScript is not forgiven, forgiving at all. So, if I don't capitalize something right, if I say ID with a capital D, when I go and load this page, nothing happens. All right? It's important to use the troubleshooting tools because what you don't want to do is simply stare at it until the right answer jumps out of the monitor and hits you on the head. All right? Because that's going to take a while. So you want to have a sort of a systematic way of debugging it. The first thing is, is to look to see if there's any errors being reported. Well, I don't see any errors on the screen. Well, again, depending on the browser, there's a place where you can look to find the errors. I generally find that Firefox in, in Google Chrome does a, a really good job reporting the errors. If you click on this thing here, go down to tools, JavaScript Council, and this is Google Chrome, there'll be something similar in Firefox, it will show me, kind of, all right, gives me the error message that says undefined is not a function. Hmm. Well, it's trying its best. Remember, this is a computer program. It, it doesn't have intelligence as we think of intelligence. But it did tell you the line that it had the problem on. And it's line 22. So if we look at line 22, sure enough it's this line, the line that I messed up. And when it says that undefined is not a function, in essence what it's saying is, is it doesn't know of anything called get element by ID with a capital D. So at the very least, this will point you to the line or near the line where it had the difficulty. All right. Now, to the point before, do we need a mouse out? Yep. Because otherwise, we saw the things just sort of stacked on each other. And we simply set the display back to none. on the ESPN page, if I put my mouse over that, I can go down here and look. How am I going to solve that problem? Because the way I have it now, if you imagine these sections being menus or having links, if I put my mouse on it, it appears that part's good. But when I go to click on one of those links, boom, it disappears. On the mouse over for the section itself, you put that. Exactly. So, let 
me do one and see if it works. track all right there's a little teeny gap between there and there Boom. so we have to make sure that those that that is flush up against there all right because otherwise you go you know you may be fast but you're never going to be faster than the browser is so as soon as you take the mouse off of that it disappears and you don't you're not able to get your mouse down there in time so by simply pushing up that section, and I'm going to cheat a little bit, and I'm going to say margin top negative 10 pixels. Just to bump that up a little bit. still a problem. Why? Because there's a little gap underneath the link. Does the page come the, the mar remember that there's always certain defaults built into the browser. So, uh, and your, your CSS over, overrides them. So, um, yeah, and again, we're still having a little bit of a gap, but we could tweak that a little bit by putting... Sounds reasonable. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So I would, I can get rid of that negative 10 now. But that's a good solution. Looks like we're doing it some of the time. I don't know. Anyhow, that's that's the issue. The idea is, is with 20 minutes of playing, we got something that approximates, and again, with another five hours worth of playing to, to tweak this. Um, your, what I'd like you to try for next, what days do we meet? We meet Monday and Wednesday. Monday and Wednesday is try to fix that issue. 
Alright. Pardon me? Yeah, it's a homework. There's just no points for the homework. Alright. Uh, yeah, this is just an exercise. This, this isn't something to turn in. And we'll talk about that on Monday of next week. Alright. We'll also on Monday of next week talk about your second homework assignment, which if I remember right is to add a style sheet switcher to a page, which may seem like an intimidating task, but it actually is not that bad. All right. Um, and we'll take a look at that on whatever day it is, Monday as well. All right. See you over in lab.